Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Pastor Emery Brown is here. Um, I did a preliminary introduction of him in the cafeteria already. Let me just mention a little bit more of my previous contact with Pastor Emery. Um, I have been in classes that he has taught on various subjects, one an in-depth exposition of the book of Acts and the expansion of the church, another one on um, uh, Paul's letters and on development of Christian doctrine, both throughout church history and into the modern day. And um, over the years, uh, being in these multi-denominational, multi-ethnic men's group gatherings has given me uh, abundant occasion to um, learn from this man of God and to appreciate the uh, wisdom that he brings to whatever subject is at hand. And uh, when I heard his presentation last Saturday on this subject that I think is very relevant for us to deal with, and uh, when he agreed to come and speak about it again, I was just delighted. I, uh, it is uh, my honor and privilege to introduce to everyone at this time, Pastor Emery Brown. Good afternoon. So good to be here. Amen. I have been here for graduations, but uh, I thank God to be here for this particular occasion. Uh, excited about the opportunity. I've known Dr. Chen, uh, as he said, several years, and we've had some great conversations and times that we've spent talking about uh, the things of God and things of God's church and God's kingdom, and we're so excited. Uh, that um, God does have solutions and answers, amen, for us in all the affairs of life. And so thank you uh, for your time. Thank you for uh, having me come and share with you this afternoon. I look forward to what God will do in the midst of us. So let me, uh, if you would, let me pray, amen. And um, as we go ahead and just go to the Lord uh, before his throne of grace, um, I, I just want to uh, uh, pray that he would lead us in all things. Amen. Father, we do thank you uh, this afternoon and we do acknowledge you. Uh, our eyes are on you uh, in the midst of everything that will be going on in the midst of our school here, in the midst of our city, in the midst of the country. Uh, Lord, we just thank you for uh, the truth. We thank you for uh, you being on your throne, you being exalted, you being uh, all-knowing and all-powerful and everywhere present. And that, Lord, you have all the answers we could ever need. And so would you bless us this afternoon to begin to think through uh, all the things uh, that are before us as teachers, as faculty, as leaders, as parents, as pastors. Uh, we're so desirous uh, to do the right thing, uh, to bring you glory and to bring you honor. In the name that's above every other name, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As we have uh, worked through this process uh, in our own church and in our own uh, network of churches. Okay, thank you. Um, just give me a second to try to get on the highway. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay. Um, the uh, truth that I'd like to share with you, the the uh, ideas that we want to share uh, this morning, as we spend this time, to, this afternoon, as we spend this time together, I believe are so pertinent and so important as um, we are facing many of the things that we are facing. Um, we want to be able to have the mind of Christ. We want to be able, as teachers, as parents, as churches, to be able to know what time it is. 
Um, you know, we shared uh, last Saturday in a group of men that uh, we talked about being like the sons of Issachar and being those who knew uh, the times that they were in. They understood the times, but secondly, they also knew what to do. And uh, it, it speaks so much to us even here today and in our families, in our schools as Christians. And we just are excited that we're not in the dark, that God does give wisdom and does give understanding. We also thought of Mordecai and, and him speaking to Esther and saying to her and encouraging her that who knows whether or not uh, you've come to the kingdom at such a time as this. And so um, you were born, I was born at this time. Amen, we weren't born in the 1800s, we weren't born in the 1600s. We were born in, the, in, in whatever year you were born, but we live in the 20s, amen? And so we wanna be able to, uh, like David said, we wanna serve God in our generation. And so what we have here is the ideal for today, um, worldview. We want to talk about worldview a little bit. We want to talk about then a biblical worldview. And then we want to apply all that to this idea of racism. Amen. There is the way that the world thinks in various ways. And then there is the way that we've been given by revelation. Amen. By who we believe is the only God. And then there is bringing all that to bear on this issue of racism which is a very hot topic, amen, uh, in the midst of our um, times that we live in. And so we want to be able to spend the time to um, uh, recognize that there is a grappling with uh, racial and ethnic tensions uh, in a, a Christian school setting from a biblical worldview perspective. There's a grappling, there's a seeking to uh, engage. Uh, there's this seeking to overcome anything that needs to be overcome in order to move forward. Uh, I had spent a, a lot of time uh, just being a pastor. Amen. I've traveled and done a lot of work in East Africa, over eight or nine countries. I've been in various organizations in this country, and I've spent a lot of my time just uh, working with preaching the gospel, developing families, teaching about how to live the Christian life. But when 2020 came, uh, it was really a wake up call as a pastor and as our elders board. Um, COVID, uh, assure you, we, we uh, feel, amen, empathetic for those who have lost uh, loved ones and uh, have went through the things that this particular uh, disease has brought about. But for me also, uh, I grieved. I grieved as a pastor when I looked at social media, when I looked at media, and I saw the responses uh, to some of the issues of race and um, the police and things of that nature. Um, really was very grieved how Christians responded in many cases, people I knew, people I respected, people in my community and elsewhere, how they responded uh, to what happened with George Floyd, how they responded to what's been happening um, throughout the country at times. I grieved in my heart in 2020 uh, at the responses. I, I understand the world. I understand people who don't know God. I understand people who uh, don't understand God's purposes and God's atonement in Christ. And, but I, I had trouble with the Christians um, and some of their responses to what had happened and what is happening. And so that set me on a course. That set me to start to think about things. Um, I began to question uh, a lot of things about the time we're living in, the spirit uh, that we live in in this age. And I began to just do study on worldview. Amen. Why do people think the way they do? You know, uh, where does that come from? In philosophy, it's epistemology. Amen. But how do be people come up with the things they, they think and the things they live by? 
and it led me to want to do a study on worldview and biblical worldview. I watched BLM, I watched Antifa like many of you did, I watched the social forces politically, I watched the mainstream media, and I grieved, amen. Uh, and so uh, when we think about these things, um, let's come to terms, amen. Uh, this afternoon so that we're all on the same page. I'm talking to teachers, so I probably don't have to do much explanation. Is that right? <laughs> but uh, uh, the world of view, this word world view appears to have come into English as a translation of the German word, uh, Weltanschauung. Uh, and it means world, amen, and it means point of view or opinion or perception. And so my question down there is, where do you get yours? Amen. Where do people get their worldview? It's so important to, to think about that. And to most people don't spend the time to sit back. And, and, you know, I have a thing I do with my elders. And we go back through our lives. And we, we look at the high points of our lives. We look at the bad points. We, we try to get at those big times when God intervened in our lives and, and what has molded us and shaped us. And when we write out a plan for our families and for our church and for the future, and most people don't. We don't sit around and think about where uh, a lot of our ideas and thoughts and aspirations actually come from. But here, uh, the question is, where do you get yours? And it's so vital for us to deal with that. What is the worldview again? Well, briefly, the total perspective by which a person or a culture perceives and interprets the world. I would say that's important, right? <laughs> I would think if you don't know and if you don't actually try to live by your worldview, then you'll be pretty fragmented, amen, in life, amen. And I think that there are forces that are counting on the fact that many people are fragmented in the way they see life, the way they see the world. Um, so uh, briefly, it's the total perspective. It's some core beliefs. It's some ultimate ideas that we hold to. Sometimes without even thinking, we hold to certain things that we count as being ultimate or being reality. And so to have a good harness and a handle on those things is very important for what we're talking about today and in general in our lives. Uh, many worldview thinkers ask these questions. No matter how I, I went and studied all the way back to Francis Schaeffer and some other uh, and people in history that just have um, uh, reputations as being people who are thinkers and philosophers and Christians, um, what I've found is that many keep talking about uh, these questions, you know, to be able to get to a worldview. And that is, who am I? Who am I? What a question. Amen. Who am I? Uh, where am I? What is wrong? And what is the answer? N.T. Wright, amen, uh, out of the United Kingdom, uh, would, would bring uh, an additional ideal right adds some others. What time is it and where do we belong in history? So those are some very interesting questions that um, we need to answer for ourselves. We need to answer as parents and families. We need to be able to answer that as um, churches and schools. Uh, and when we do that, uh, we, we continue to uh, find some very interesting things. All communities, all human communities live out of some story that provides a context for understanding the meaning of history and gives shape and direction to their lives. Amen. And that comes out of a book called The Drama of Scripture that just seeks to follow the, the line, storyline of the Bible, uh, the kingdom, the covenants, the promises, in order to try to uh, see the Bible as an overarching story, a grand story that's unfolding in the midst of history, in the midst of men. And, and so all human communities, and I thought about that when I first saw that, I thought about my own community. I was born and raised on the east side of Buffalo, amen. And, and uh, from a little child, I was fed a narrative, amen? I was fed a narrative. And uh, my parents somehow came up with that narrative, but as a narrative, 
uh, I was taught and, and it was modeled before me and my, all my friends and just about everybody in the community that, you know, don't even think about it. You are a Democrat. Amen. And uh, so that narrative uh, stayed with us and we were taught that the, the, the white people were Republicans and they were rich and pretty much they didn't want to see Democrats or blacks uh, advance. And so you grow up with that narrative and I'm not here to offend Democrats or Republicans, but I want to tell you the narrative I grew up under. And as I grew up under that kind of narrative, um, then I began to realize that sometimes stories are told to you Amen. And they may be stories that are not accurate and, and they're stories that may not be actually uh, true. But people, they thrive on narratives and stories that are either given to them or that they concoct or that they find. But I began to realize the truth of that narrative in my own life. And I began to realize that my story uh, wasn't going to be the same as the story of my neighborhood in, in many cases. As I began to go back and look at who the real Jim Crow people were, who were the real segregationists. And, and I found out it wasn't the Republican Party. And so that was uh, eye-opening to me. It began to, I began to understand by search and by history that the Ku Klux Klan was not a Republican group, far from it. <laughs> I began to see the story and the narrative was very different than what I was told. So that just gives you to see that we don't think about it, but uh, people can be fed a narrative, uh, people can be fed a worldview and never question it, amen until we learn to do our own studies and think for ourselves. So who are we as Christians? Uh, we can answer that from a biblical perspective. We are beings created in God's image. That's who we are. We are beings created in God's image. Uh, where are we? We are in the world created by God. He created everything good. Amen. Over and over again in Genesis, he says, good, good. And it was good. And it was good. It was very good. Amen. We know that sin, next, um, is that what's wrong? Sin interrupted uh, what God had put in motion, amen, temporarily. Sin had its impact and its destructive destruction that took place. What is the answer? Faith in Jesus Christ. That's our biblical worldview, faith in Jesus Christ. What time is it? Well, it's time for us to be intentional. Amen. Uh, for a long time, we've just sat around and just believed that when you die, you go to heaven. Amen. If you're a believer and uh, but I think to the gospel and to the gospel of the kingdom, there's more to it than just hoping to get out of this mess one day. Amen. But there's a call that God has for us to live while we're in this world. Um, so what time is it? It's time to be intentional at this time in history. Um, we have been chosen to fight this fight with the full armor of God. Amen. It's before us. And by the time we close today, I can't see the clock there that well, so you're all in trouble. <laughs> um, you know, it's time for us to be able to know what it is that we have to do. And by the end of our time together, I pray that there is some thoughts, there's some wisdom from God and some things that we can know that we need to be about in order to move forward in this time we live in. I mentioned it already, uh, the grand narrative of the Bible forms the foundation for a biblical and Christian worldview. The big story of God, amen. So long we've been nitpicking the Bible and studying things and doctrines separate from each other, but the Bible is an unfolding drama of God revealing progressively who he is, what he's doing, and what his aim is. And so uh, we need that in place to be able to then form a biblical worldview. I put biblical slash Christian worldview because it's the same. Jesus said it in Luke. He says that the prophets and the Psalms and the writings are all about me, amen? So Christianity and a biblical worldview are synonymous, amen? So as we move forward, the most basic foundation and introduction is Genesis chapters one through three. Uh, it's amazing how God has just everything that, that has happened that he wanted to do that, that's unfolding. Really, we can see it in seed and an in introductory form right there in Genesis 1 through 3. And so we can, you know, see that in those chapters, chapters 1 through 3, we have creation, we have the fall, and we have redemption. And that uh, is what we're in the middle of right now. Amen. 
Uh, creation by God, the fall by man, and then redemption. The whole Bible then unfolds in various ways to, to, to show how God is redeeming. Not only men and women who confess their sins and repent, but he's redeeming the whole creation. Amen. He's setting things straight. Amen. We've kind of sometimes narrowed it down to just dying and going to heaven, like I said. But God is going to redeem all things. And so creation, fall and redemption for many biblical world thinkers, uh, it unfolds from creation to recreation. And we can see how God is wanting to redeem and restore uh, all things. And when we think of that, uh, Creation, fall, and redemption, properly understood, leads to a proper and biblical Christian worldview. And so it is very important for us to see that. I'm going to have to speed up here because we got a lot to cover. Amen. Uh, creator, in Genesis, we see him as creator. Amen. Right there, it, it, it dispels from many of us who are believers uh, all the things that, that are being taught, Lord, and, and how even sciences, in some cases, has been hijacked and they want to get away from a creator. They want to get away from a maker. But for us, he is central to all things. And so in Genesis 1, 1, God just begins. Moses just writes in the beginning, God. Amen. He created everything. But then we move also in that first chapter of Genesis, man uh, in his image and the cultural mandate we get in Genesis chapter 1, uh, verses 26 to 28. He creates man in his own image. Amen. And tells them to be fruitful and to multiply and subdue the earth and have dominion. There's a mandate there that God gives. And so man, it's huge. We call it imago dei. Amen. God has created us in his image. Amen. He's not a big man walking around in heaven with hands and feet. Amen. That image is spiritual. That image has to do with righteousness and the ability to, to think and to plan and to, and to love. And all those things were created to be like God in that way. And then we have this distinction that's fought against uh, desperately in our day and age, like in no other time before, uh, this idea of male and female distinction. We see it from God, amen, in creation. Uh, there are other narratives, other stories, other political forces and philosophical forces that want to change how we see things like that. But we have it, once again, by our creator who created us in his image to make sure that we understand uh, how he's done things. Then we have temptation, sin, and the fall. Uh, amen. And uh, we have some huge things going on here that we need to look at. But finally, when it comes to redemption, we have what's called the Proto-Evangelum. And that's the first message of salvation, the first message of deliverance that has to do with God making um, this declaration. And he actually makes it, amen, to the serpent. I'm going to crush your head. You're going to bruise his heel, but I'm going to crush your head. And we know that if you go to Revelations chapter 12, then you know that that serpent that, that, that the Lord was speaking to was actually Satan in Revelations chapter 12, verse 9. And so that's redemption. That's creation and it's uh, temptation and fall and it's uh, redemption where God is going to go about to uh, win his creation back through Jesus Christ. So the history of man and the history of the whole world is found here and here alone. That's so important to acknowledge and to recognize, amen? There are not a, there, there's not a lot of truths that we can somehow navigate through. I used to be like that. I used to study with the Buddhists. I used to study astrology. I used to study New Age movement. I used to think I could bring all these things together and, and it'd be wonderful if I know all these things and finally get to the, to the place where I was getting at, and that was to come to the place where I am God. That's what it was leading me to. But as it led me to that through studying Egyptian uh, pyramids and the Book of the Dead, as it, it, at the same time, it kept confusing me to the point of suicide because I just couldn't make it all fit. But our truth, the scripture's truth, is the whole history of the whole world and it's found here and nowhere else. But I want to focus on all this in terms of autonomy, personal autonomy, that they had no right to. 
Let's go back to the garden. Let's go back to that one particular issue. Uh, God gives them his word. He gives them his absolute word on the subject. You can eat of all the trees of the fruit of the garden, but of the, uh, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you must not eat. And so that's absolute. I mean, God is in charge. God is creator. God is maker. And so when they fell at that temptation, when they uh, fell at the hands of the enemy, uh, we need to realize we're dealing with something very, very impactful. The Bible, I want to make this declaration from the drama of scripture book I mentioned earlier. The Bible is public truth for the whole world. It's not just American truth. Amen. It's not Christianity is not for Americans. Amen. Or Western civilization. It's for the whole world. It's the history of the whole world. And we need to not be pushed into our homes and pushed into our churches. We need to acknowledge it's the history of the whole world. Amen. And so um, autonomy, autonomy. We, maybe sometimes we've never connected this, but I want to I want to work with this this afternoon S to autonomy is self-government or the right of self-government. That's what was happening in that temptation in that fall. Uh, the Greek is uh, autonomous, having one's own laws, self-legislating, having the right or power of self-government. Uh, an autonomous territory, you know, like in Seattle, they, had a, they tried to have an autonomous zone. Amen. Didn't work too well, but they did try it. Undertaken or carried on without outside control, self-contained, existing or capable of existing independently. All that was happening in the garden. All that was happening at the temptation. Amen. And, the, and the, the craftiness of that is if I can get you to act independently of God, then indirectly you'll be under my authority. He's crafty. He was crafty. And we'll move on to see how crafty in this next few moments. So Genesis 3, in that temptation and fall into autonomy, disobedience, sin, it is self-law against God's law or his word. They put themselves under the enemy's craftiness. They put themselves. And this, this is not some deep theoretical historical information. This happens every day of your life and mine. Amen. It's so important for us to grasp this uh, this afternoon. Uh, the self-legislating man and woman after the work of the serpent or Satan, Revelations 12, 9, would show up time and time again in scripture and in history. So I'll call this autonomy and this personal autonomy that they had no right to. I'll now call it the spirit of the age, the spirit of autonomy. Those two terms I, I use interchangeably in my church and in times when I'm sharing like this. It's the spirit of the age and it's the spirit of autonomy. It's the work of the enemy consistently promoting man separate from God. And we'll see it develop in history in a moment. Um, the spirit of our attitude of autonomy uh, came. Amen. Uh, when God confronted him, you know, I'm not my brother's keeper. Amen. Just an independent attitude. And God warned him that sin was crouching at his door and its desire was for him. But he needed to master it. Amen. By obeying and, and, and worshiping as he should. But he didn't. We know that. And Babel. Amen. God has had the intention of scattering the people throughout the earth and they get together and say, no, let's all get together. Amen. Let's all be one minded. Let's do our own thing. So we see even in Babel in the flood, things got so bad that God wiped it all out. Amen. Sin constantly day and night, lust and flesh and sin. And so God allowed there to be a flood, even in Israel, even among a religious people. Even in Israel, we see where they would get in the middle of the wilderness and they would not like their circumstances, their situation. And they would all group together and say, let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. It's autonomy. It's a spirit of autonomy. That's 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 separation from God and wanting to be out from under his authority. After he did all the miracles and all the things he did, they said, let us choose a leader. Let's go back to Egypt. 
You see that, that thing, that spirit of autonomy, that spirit of the enemy constantly working in fallen man, but also so bad in Israel that they actually ended up having to be sent into Assyria and sent into uh, Babylon because they had so disobeyed and so uh, uh, resisted God's law and God's promises that he actually uh, warned them time and time again, but they ended up in captivity. And so we see it there in the Pharisees, of course, where Jesus would come right out and say to them, you are of your father, the devil. Amen. Uh, those who would not acknowledge uh, the teachings of who he was. So a biblical perspective, a biblical worldview understands the connection between the cultural mandate of Genesis 1:26 through 28 and Matthew 28, 18. Isn't that amazing? Amen. God created man in his own image and he, and he wanted man to bring him glory and honor. He wanted man to go from just the, the, the garden into the whole earth and spreading the knowledge. And the, that was the original purpose and it's going to be a restored purpose. But we see that in Jesus Christ, he comes back and says the same thing, essentially. Amen. Go to all nations and make disciples. Amen. Uh, go ahead and, and teach people the things that I've taught you, and because God is going to restore a people for himself, and he's going to restore his original plan, amen, in a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. And uh, so there's a connection there. We had in science, in your education, as a teacher, as doctors, as college professors, as pastors, we have that right. We have that call to, to broadcast the wisdom and the, knowledge, and the knowledge of God in the midst of our profession. Professions. Amen. For time's sake and to approach our third topic, which is racism, especially in the West, you know, because we could talk about it all over the place. There's been problems racially all over the place, you know, in all kinds of ways. It's not just uh, America and the issues we're facing now. But at least in the West, we want to have this conversation. If we think about this spirit of autonomy and if we think about this spirit of the age, then many of you have studied this, amen, and uh, historians have identified several causes for the, emerge, uh, for the emergence of the Renaissance following the Middle Ages, such as increased uh, interaction between different cultures, uh, the discovery of ancient Greek and Roman texts, the emergence of humanism, uh, different artistic and technological innovations and the impacts of conflict, autonomy establishes humanism. And I put my, my name there because, uh, my nickname there because the rest of it comes from historycrunch.com. But I put that last line there for us to be able to see the connection uh, between autonomy, personal autonomy, and how it would then flow uh, through Greek philosophy, through Plato, and, and you could just uh, do all kinds of study to see that more and more there's, a, there's this dependency on human uh, rationale and human reason separated from God. And it's important to realize that what we see there is autonomy begins to actually form or establish itself as humanism in this renaissance. Then after the renaissance, what happened? We all know uh, European history, at least, of uh, the age of enlightenment, also known as the age of reason or simply the enlightenment. It was an intellectual and philosophical movement that dominated the world of ideas in Europe during the 17th and 18th centuries. And uh, as we think of the Age of Enlightenment, uh, it was known as the Age of Reason, was an intellectual and cultural movement in the 18th century that emphasized reason over superstition and science over blind faith. So we, we see it working again. There's nothing wrong with rationale. There's nothing wrong with logic. There's nothing wrong with science. God gave us all those things. But when we take those things and try to separate them from the rulership and the connection to God, we end up with humanism. We end up with personal autonomy. We end up with a world run amok. And so uh, we see it developing in history. We see it unfolding, amen. And as we continue, the Enlightenment included a range of ideas centered on the sovereignty of reason and the evidence of the senses as the primary sources of knowledge and advanced ideals such as liberty, progress, toleration, fraternity, constitutional government, and separation of church and state. 
And so a lot of ideas and a lot of thoughts begin to emerge. And the problem with that is, is it emerge being uh, wanting to be independent uh, from the ideal of an absolute truth from an absolute God. And so we see our history. We're learning what we've come through and what's happening in the West. Um, an 18th century intellectual movement whose three central concepts were the use of reason, the scientific method, and progress. Enlightenment thinkers believed they could help create better societies and better people. Very important for us to recognize uh, this Tower of Babel mentality. <laughs> Um, you know, so through science, through just science alone, through logic, we're going to build a, a society of better people and enlightenment thinkers who believe that reason uh, would lead to universal and objective truths. Criticized the institution of absolute monarchy and the established church. At that time, it was the Catholic Church, which were the controlling sources of government and learning. This criticism was based upon the abuses of both institutions. So there were some things that were wrong. There was some in the monarchy we know and uh, Marie Antoinette and her husband who was king were put in a guillotine because they were so abusive and, and, the, and the, the, the church at that time had their own agendas and they were abusive and so there was a rebel against all that and uh, we know that especially as the French Revolution. Amen. The French Revolution took place and was a watershed event in the modern European history that began in 1789 and ended in the late 1790s with the accent of Napoleon Bonaparte. Now, you know all this, but I want to make these connections be between all this, the spirit of autonomy and the spirit of the age and where we live right now. Uh, what were the ideals of the French Revolution? The ideals of the French Revolution are liberty, equality, fraternity, liberty. Uh, or freedom was with regard to the 18th century. Liberty meant freedom from all sorts of torture and abuse. And so you can search that out, you can study that further. It, it had its ideas, it had its goals. But as we think of all this unfolding, uh, we have to realize that right after the French Revolution, we have Karl Marx. And, and we have uh, him coming to bear with his ideas. Um, one of the things he's famous for being able to say and promote is what you see is all there is. What you see is all there is. So you have no soul, there is no God, there is no spiritual realm, there is no truth of a God that we need to acknowledge, amen. It's so important that we see that he and Friedrich Engels were, were very adamant about you know, the economy and their philosophy was the answer for a society rather than depending on some kind of invisible supernatural being. Uh, the dialectic says that in everything there is a thesis. In other words, the way things are and an antithesis, uh, an opposition to the way things are, which must be inevitably, which must inevitably clash. The result of the struggle and merging that comes from the clash is the synthesis, which becomes the new thesis. <laughs> this new thesis will eventually attract another antithesis and produce a new synthesis. So what we're seeing is dialectic materialism. What we're seeing is this is his philosophy and this is what he believed would happen. We'll, we'll work that out a little more in a minute. By dialectics perceives the developmental process as an upward spiral. Simply stated, dialectics sees change or process due to conflict or struggle as the only constant. And this change and conflict always leads to a more advanced level, understanding the times David Nobel. I had his class in 2005 when I was in college, and that was my first exposure to a, a biblical worldview, understanding the time. So when we look at this, we, we see that Marx promoted this ideal. There needs to be clashing. There needs to be a changing. Uh, there needs to be an assault on the way things are and so that there can be a new um, uh, establishment, a new way of seeing things, a new way of doing things. And then from Marx, a little while after, came something called the Frankfurt School. Amen. And from the Frankfurt School, uh, they weren't like Marx. Marx wanted violent revolution. 
Amen. Marx said, you know, we need to destroy and overthrow capitalism. We need to destroy the bourgeoisie. We need to be able through violent revolution when necessary, take control. Amen. And, and, and through class struggles, people clashing with each other and the poor and the underprivileged clashing, clashing against those who have. He felt like that needed to happen through revolution, which would be violent. Uh, so what we have here uh, is the Frankfurt School that followed his ideas but stopped for a moment and said, no, we're not going to be able to overthrow certain Western societies like even the U.S. or certain places in Europe by violent revolution. We've got to do it through infiltrating and, and um, being immersed in the institutions, in the culture, in the churches, in the universities with the same kind of ideal of clashing and classing and it's very important that we get this because this is happening in our, ha our families, our churches, and our schools when we see some of the aggravations that people have. Um, behind it many times is the spirit of autonomy. Behind it many times is the spirit of the age. And so we find that critical theory is a broad area of knowledge that originated with the Frankfurt School in the 1930s and has expanded and evolved dramatically since then. It has spawned entire disciplines such as critical race theory, critical pedagogy, and queer theory, and is highly influential within the social justice movement. The things we're seeing, the things we're dealing with today have roots. They didn't just come up in the last uh, 10 years. They didn't come up in the last few years. What we're looking at today is something that has been a strategy, something that has been a philosophy, something that goes back in history and that has its connections. What I merely wanted to do was take it back to the garden. Amen? The spirit of autonomy, the spirit of one, not wanting to be uh, under God, the spirit of wanting to be self-legislating and be uh, those who could solve their own problems, gain their own wisdom from God. We just wanted to reach back in history all the way to man's beginning to see that these things that are emerging are nothing new. They, they have connections, amen? Critical theory and, and goes back to the Frankfurt School, goes back to Marx, goes back to the French Revolution. It continues to have a history before us. So contemporary critical theory views reality through the lens of power, dividing people into oppressed groups and oppressor groups along various axes like race, class, Gender, sexually orientation, sexual orientation, and physical ability and age. This is being mastered today. Amen. It's being used in all kinds of ways, being pushed by mainline media, and, and it's a philosophy that we've seen already. It does have its roots in something other than God. So contemporary critical theory uh, really is using these different classes and, and forming people into particular groups and, and helping them see, for instance, that they are not uh, getting their fair share. They are not uh, being able to be included in all the advances of society. Critical theory functions as a worldview. Please hear this. Uh, it functions as a worldview. It literally is being, today, is starting to drive our literal administration of this country in various ways. It's behind it. Buffalo is leading the way with Chicago in getting this kind of idea and thoughts into our public school system to teach our children these things that we're presenting today. It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. And too many times we have been asleep at the wheel. But what's happening here is it's driving our country. This is a new world view. And the biggest thing we need to realize today that the fight is not against necessarily the white man. The fight is not against Western civilization. The fight is against God. The fight is against his absolutes. The fight is against his absolute authority. But if we're not careful, we begin to look at each other as black, white, Asian, lesbian, straight, gay. And, and the fight is being promoted by those who are promoting critical theory, uh, race theory. And so we have to understand, um, uh, they answer some of these worldview questions, amen? Uh, who, uh, who are we, okay? Uh, what is our fundamental problem? 
What is the solution to that problem? What is our primary moral duty? And how should we live? They're answering that. And it's not from a Christian worldview. Amen. They're answering that question through books and writings. I just had a friend of mine uh, get their Ph.D. in education and invited me to 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 participate. And I once again, I didn't know that this Christian, that this person who loved the Lord and 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 I had been her pastor and she moved to New York City. And when I went for her Ph.D. Um, uh, time when they would assess her. Um, she promoted all these ideas of critical theory, critical race theory, critical social justice, not knowing the history of it. And it really grieved me so. But she's developing a worldview that is contrary to a biblical worldview. Christians, uh, Christianity provides us with an overarching meta narrative that runs from creation to redemption. We are creatures. Um, made in God's image, who have sinned against him, who need to be rescued uh, through the atoning work of Jesus and who are called to love both God and neighbor. In contrast, critical theory is associated with a meta narrative that runs from oppression to liberation. We are members either of a dominant group or of a marginalized group with respect to a given identity marker. As such, we either need to divest ourselves of power and seek to liberate others, or we need to acquire power and liberate ourselves by dismantling all structures and institutions that subjugate and oppress. Are we in 2021 yet? In critical theory, the greatest sin is oppression, and the greatest virtue is the pursuit of liberation. This is where we live. And so there was no revolution. They infiltrated Harvard and Yale and Brown and Duke. Amen. And they began to take over some of the institutions of our country. Politics who always jump on board, whatever's best, have bought into it and are promoting it. And so we have this culture in our country. And um, I wanted to go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, just to begin to say, what do we do with all this? What do we do with this? What do you do as a school? What's important as a, a family, as our churches? How do we combat this? How do we stand against this? How do we educate uh, our people, uh, whether it be in a school or church? Well, the scripture has it there laid out for us, and we have to begin to educate and help people understand the truth. Amen. That is so important for us to realize. It says here, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So when we think about this, we're grappling with this ideal of spiritual warfare. This is spiritual warfare. We could call it political, we could call it uh, racial, we could call it a lot of things, but the fact is we're in a spiritual warfare. You here at Christian Central Academy, you're a part of a spiritual warfare. You're dealing with education, you're, you're educating children, you're giving them a biblical worldview, and the society that they're growing up in is, doesn't want that worldview. They, they reject that worldview, but it's spiritual warfare. You are seeking to overcome overcome the spirit of the age as you teach the Bible, as you teach creation, as you teach the distinction of men and women, as you teach redemption, as you teach, amen, morality from God's standpoint, you are seeking to overcome the spirit of the age. It's a battle of ideas. It's a battle of ideas. And so we need to realize that. We need to uh, thank God that he's given us revelation. We know what he wants. We know what he's doing. It's absolute versus serpentine. <laughs> Amen. Right back to the garden again. We have absolute truth. We know creation. We know God's plan. We know who he is in Christ Jesus. Everything else that denies and resists that, resists that is serpentine. Amen. No matter how good it looks, no matter how wonderful it sounds, if it's not something that has its direct or indirect source as God, as truth, then we end up with the same lie that the serpent told the first couple. 
But we have this divine connection. Um, what connects the believer is not earthly race or ethnicity. Amen. This is important to understand. Uh, it's sad when people try to find their identity and their dignity in the color of their skin. And this is a major, major deception that's happening. Amen. And we need to recognize it as such. When people put more emphasis on their color uh, or their ethnicity, amen, than they do what God says in this verse that we're going to unpack a little bit more. Um, what connects the believer is not earthly race or ethnicity. And God wants us to grasp this and know this and teach our children that they may be able to be rooted and grounded in this reality that what our essential being is has nothing to do with our ethnicity in this life. It goes beyond that. Uh, but Christology is our uh, connection. Christology is what connects all of us together. Amen. We need a biblical worldview. We need a biblical mindset. And so it's so important to realize that life in the spirit, regeneration, being born again, having the spirit of God and having a biblical worldview is the connection, the divine connection that we need. Amen. Uh, I am closer to some. I, I pastor a multicultural, multi ethnic, multiracial, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> I pastor a church that has all kinds of people in it, older, younger, all different kinds of backgrounds. And, and, you know, our focus is the cross. Our focus is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our focus, I'm closer to them in many respects than I am to people in my own physical, biological family because of a Christian mindset, amen? Because of the redemption of Jesus, because we have the same spirit. And we have, the scripture says, the mind of Christ. So we have to stop arguing and fussing with people who reject absolute truth and demonstrate to them the gospel of Jesus Christ in our lives. And so it's so important here to recognize. Um, Mike Dicker once said it. i never forget. I was watching television. I'm a football fan. And I was watching television. And Mike Dicker was on a sports show. And he was so upset with the Detroit Lions. I mean, they couldn't win a game to save their lives. And he wasn't their coach. He was just a, 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 a sports broadcaster on one of the news shows. And, and he was so upset with the Detroit Lions for losing all their games. He looked out into the camera and he had this, this, this look on his face where I wouldn't want to be in the room with him uh, if he was correcting me. But he looked out into the camera at millions of people, and he was talking to the Detroit Lions. And he was chastising them. He says, who are you? That's the first thing he said to the Detroit Lions. Who are you? And I'm saying that to, to, to your particular school here. Uh, who are you as Christian Central Academy? Who are you? He said that to the Detroit Lions who were losing every game, and I'm not saying you are. <laughs> but they were losing every game. And he said, who are you? The next thing he said was, what is your identity as a team? What is your identity? Why do you exist? What's your agenda? What are you hoping to accomplish? He was saying that to the Detroit Lions, until you know who you are as a team, until you begin to play according to the plan, you won't be on the same page. Then the last thing he says, establish your identity. He felt that if he could get them to realize who are you as a football team, establish your identity as a football team, then he could get them moving in the right direction to win some games and to conquer some of their problems and some of their challenges. So divine use of the dialectical materialism. I want to share this with you. God is amazing as we come to a close soon. God is amazing that Karl Marx would come up with this clashing and classing of the clashing of the races and 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 the, the economic issues that he wanted to overthrow capitalism. But with God, if he were to use a man, if he's at work frustrating the enemy, then his work is not about class distinction. Amen. God has no issues with those who have and those who have not. They all need him. 
Amen. And then they need to live out who they are in love for him and love for others. With God, there is no class distinction. Uh, God will use, I believe, what's happening in the midst of us in critical race theory, critical justice issues and the dialectical materialism that we're finding in our day and age. Uh, but he's not trying to overthrow capitalism like Marx was. He's not trying to overthrow capitalism. He's not trying to overthrow the bourgeoisie. God is not trying to do that. God is not uh, allowing there to be um, the clashing of the classes. But what we do need to see that I believe that he's usurping the dialectical. He's actually going to use that same kind of strategy to overthrow sin. How are we going to see this? Uh, to overthrow apathy in the church. Amen. Like I said, we've been asleep at the wheel. I mean, they took over Harvard and all that decades ago. They took over our education system in certain states decades ago. Amen. We weren't at the public school board meetings, many of us, at least I can speak for myself. I wasn't in the midst of the community railing out against some of the decisions on the common council. Amen. Uh, to overthrow, uh, God is moving to overthrow apathy. He's overthrowing inertia. Amen. And are there now fiery serpents biting the people? Isn't, think about God for a moment. He will allow trouble. He will allow situations to come. He will allow there to be these problems in the midst of his people, in the midst of a society. We read about it with Moses where there were fiery serpents that were biting the people. Why? So that they would look to the cross. So they would look to what was the solution in, in Christ Jesus. They would look to the solution. And we need to understand that COVID-19, Antifa, BLM, and LB, LGBTQ+, all these things are a part of the spirit of autonomy. There's no way you're going to connect those things back to a biblical worldview. They reject a biblical worldview. They reject the truth of a biblical worldview. Yet... We have it in our society and it's increasing and it's becoming uh, something that is very important for us to realize and recognize. So once again, but you are a chosen race. That Greek word there has to do with the word genos. It has to do with uh, a people who are of the same biological stock. Amen. Um, you move on and it's a, a holy nation. That's another word. Amen. That's ethnos. You know, he's saying that about us, ethnos, and a people for his own possession. And so what we need to realize as we look at this is God has took the Gentile and the Jew, the black and the white. He's taken us all together, amen, and made us one race. Spiritually, when we look at who we are, we are one race people. We are one ethnos. No matter what color our skin is, our children, our people, our churches, our, we need to help people understand that there is this calling that we have by God's grace that he has called us to be his own possession. Why? That we may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. These things are happening. These things are unfolding. These things are taking their toll. But this is the opportunity for the church. This is the opportunity for your school to arise. Amen. And to show forth the excellency of him who called you. Amen. Out of darkness into his marvelous light. And it's so important for us to recognize that there needs to be strategies. We need to talk strategies. We need to talk about how we're going to be able to negotiate the problems, work with people in humility uh, to try to solve these problems. But I'll close um, by having a few things that I'll say that might be some suggestions. Is that all right, doctor? Okay. Um, we have to make sure that um, we are establishing our work on a meta narrative uh, of scripture amen that everyone from the parents to the leadership to the faculty all understand that this is all built on that unfolding story that God has given us and not on the spirit of the age amen we are to agree on it we need to see it as a school we need to articulate it to one another amen among the leaders the faculty the parents and the students um, because culture warriors are coming for Christian Central Academy I don't know if you ever thought about that but they're infiltrating all kinds of organizations and everything, and they won't settle until we adopt their, their worldview. 
Amen. So in one form or another, they will come for you as well. Schools across the nations, universities across the nations, adoption agencies across the nation are all falling to the spirit of the world. And so we need to be on the same page. Parents are ground zero. Parents are ground zero. Amen. I as a pastor and we as a church can't take the place of parents. Amen. So I always tell them, don't think you can drop your children off in Sunday school and you're done. Amen. No, this needs to start at home. You need to disciple your own children. Amen. The church can assist. What about the school? You as a school, you assist the parents. Somehow we have to make the parents even more accountable. I don't know what your strategy is here, but we need to help the parents realize uh, they, they shouldn't be chasing BMWs in a bigger house as much as focusing on their children and their ability to have a biblical worldview. And so churches are secondary, Christian schools are secondary, the home is first and foremost uh, to establish strong homes. And these efforts have to be in every discipline of your study. And then help the entire school family, and that's everybody who holds a position in one form or another, digest the truth um, of the God we sent our children to study after. Amen. There are parents who sent their children here for a reason. Amen. And so we have to help them to understand that once we set forth a biblical agenda um, to accept what you sent your children here for. Amen? You sent them here to get a Christian education from a biblical viewpoint, and we will do all we can to do that, but we need your cooperation. Amen? It's important that the parents understand that. And so as we close, there's this challenge that we're, we're going through now uh, that we need to recognize that God is moving through his church in these adverse times and it's a spiritual warfare that's full of a battle of ideas and what you're grappling with is a battle of these ideas that we need to recognize and establish ourselves so that we uh, can move forward in helping our children have the right mindset in all the affairs of life. Amen? And so um, I could email Dr. Chen, some more questions that you could actually form into small groups when you get a chance to think through some more questions and ideas. But I hope today we've had a chance to see that this racism that we're facing is a racism that has history to it. And in every dimension of what we see in our society uh, that's moving with this critical theory, it's a world view. And it's being pushed through the entire society. And we have to recognize that that is the case. And we need, to, we need to make strong churches, strong schools, strong parents, strong children to be able to think solidly in the midst uh, of an ungodly philosophy. God bless you. Amen.